These are the Simjack Mini Pedals. Why are they called Mini Pedals? Well, I'll come to answer that in this review. And something else you won't want to miss is my setup guide, as I do cover some very important information on how to do this correctly, so don't skip that. What's immediately striking is we get features you'd normally see with more expensive pedals, but the price tag is more in line with entry level load cell options from Fanatec and Thrustmaster, and that makes the Simjack Minis look like a very attractive alternative. To kick things off, let's take a tour around the features of these pedals. If you like my content, consider becoming a member to help support the channel. Click on the join button to find out more. The pedal parts are cut from 3mm thick sheet stainless steel, cut into shapes that slot together via tenon and mortise joints, and the structure is clamped together with threaded rods and bolts. Each of the pedals share the following adjustment points. Altering the height of this pivot point behind the pedal arm changes the leverage for increasing or decreasing the tension. The higher the position, the greater the tension. For a shorter throw pedal, loosen the pedal stop, push it closer to the back of the pedal and retighten. There are four positions for adjusting the pedal angle. The flat pedal faces are not adjustable. That's unfortunate as this would be rather useful. The pedals are only 18 and a half centimeters tall. This is where they get the mini moniker in their name. For a point of reference, we'll bring in my Husenfeld Pro pedals for a visual comparison. Here's a hack that raises the pedals by 2cm. You take the rear angle props and swap them with the ones in front. Be aware though, doing this angles the pedal faces. The throttle pedal is supported by a strong spring, and yes, it is slightly tarnished with rust, so I need to sort that out with a dash of oil. This long bar is the load cell sensor. From this angle, you can see the small spring compressing. This is what's pushing against the load cell and taking the inputs from the pedal. The clutch uses the same basic frame and load cell as the throttle. We do get a different type of compression spring, this is a die spring, and a longer saddle stretching over the rear of the frame. The brake is a different design to the other two pedals and houses a much sturdier 70kg load cell. The frame is effectively in two parts, with the load cell bridging the gap. The brake pedal tension is a combination of a spring and a hard rubber cylinder. The pedals plug into this control box and from the control box into your PC via a USB cable. I found that I needed to run the cable directly into a USB socket on my PC. When plugged into my powered USB hubs, the pedals would disconnect after a few minutes. So as long as I ran the USB cable to my PC and not a USB hub, I had no disconnections. Coming up next is a lengthy but important guide on how to configure the pedals in DI view. The Simjack pedals do not come with their own custom software, so we need to use third party software to do this before they are usable in game. If you want to skip this for now, use the timestamps to jump to the testing and verdict that follows right after this configuration guide segment. This is DI view. Upon launch, we get this busy screen of partitioned windows. That looks complicated. If you have multiple analog devices plugged into your PC, DI view will automatically display every device. 
To remove the clutter from the menu, go to Edit and then Settings and untick all the devices except the SIM jack pedals. Now pressing the pedals, you can see the black pointer moving. That shows the input from the pedals. This represents the analog output going into the game. Before we can calibrate the pedals, right click each panel and select View Raw Data. The red pointer represents the uncalibrated raw output. That never changes. The black pointer is currently moving in line with the red one as we haven't made any changes yet. And right now the pedals are completely useless until we calibrate them and set the minimum and maximum values. Now we're going to calibrate the gas pedal and this is the same process for the clutch and the brake too. The brake does require an additional step and we'll get to that once we've sorted out this first pedal. Take note of the values in the black text. When calibrated it should display 0% max when the pedal isn't under any load and 100% when fully pressed. As you can see here it's kind of a mess right now. Right click within the window panel and select calibration. First we'll set the min value. I'm going to take the raw number of minus 4388 and enter this. With that changed, you can clearly see the black marker movement is no longer locked to the red one. And when the pedal is not pressed, it's now showing 0% max. To calibrate the end stop pedal travel, fully press the pedal and note down the raw number. Return to the calibration window and enter the max value. It's sensible to adjust the number slightly to account for variance of the load cell input. So I'm entering a slightly lower number. The pedal input is now registering 0 through to 100% correctly. So we're almost done, but not quite. Just revisiting the min value to add a bit of dead zone and again account for variance of the load cell as I did with the max value. The final thing you need to do is calculate the center value, and that is simply the middle number between the min and max values. It's important you do this accurately, otherwise it will affect the linearity of the registered input. Now follow this procedure for the clutch pedal, it's exactly the same. For the brake, work out and enter the min value as you did before, and again add a bit of dead zone into the equation. To set the max calibration number, push hard into the pedal, or as hard as you want the pedal to be, to register 100% braking input, then take the raw value and enter that as the max value into the calibration panel. This is something you may need to test on track and return here and adjust again to get it just right for you. The final thing to do is calculate and enter the center number. Based on the min and max calibration values shown here, the middle number is minus 7000. Unfortunately, DIView will not allow me to type in a negative value. Zero is the minimum, and that is a problem. If you encounter this as well, then let me show you what I did. All you need to do is open up Notepad and type in the negative number with the minus symbol, and then copy and paste this from Notepad into DI view and that's it and this completes the setup procedure for the pedals and we can now run them in racing games. I picked up these pedals several months ago but to be fair I haven't used them that much until now for this thorough testing and this review. So when they arrived I did publish my first impressions drive and talk video. 
If you watch that, you'll know and remember that I wasn't hugely impressed at the time. The mistake I made then was I hadn't properly adjusted the brake calibration and DI view. Coming up to date now, I have set this up correctly and I'm having a much better time of it. In a moment, I'll cover the performance of the pedals in detail, but first let me just talk about the build quality first. The design of these pedals borrows heavily, or shall we just say inspired, by the original Hussenfeld Pro pedals. There's no doubt, materially, these pedals feel solid under my feet, and solid in a way that's comparable to more expensive premium pedal sets that I've used. There's no flex or lateral play, just the motion of the pedals. The tolerances of all the stainless steel parts that make up the structure of the pedals appears to be good. Now one word of warning, the brass bushings will wear down over time, and if we bring in my Hussenfeld Pro pedals again, that use the same type of brass bushings, you can see what I mean. I've owned this set of Hussenfeld Pro pedals for many years and I don't quite remember how long it took to show this wear but you can see it's there so I would say it's inevitable over the long run and um, you can see that side to side wobble because the bushings have worn down a bit. Note they haven't worn out completely and the pedals remain completely usable and function with no performance issues. Sometimes I can feel that side to side play, um, that may bother you, it may not but eventually the Simjack mini pedals will also end up like this. The brass bushings are an off-the-shelf part, so you can replace them quite simply with basic tools. So if you need to, you know, two or three years down the line, maybe sooner, maybe later, depends on how much uh, use you get out of your pedals. And really that's the only wearable part of these pedals, so generally very durable. Despite the throttle and clutch not sharing exactly the same design, they actually feel virtually identical, so much so, if I swapped them around, I wouldn't really notice. The throttle spring does have a bit more tension, and to be kind, there is a slight whiff of a digressive clutch, but kind of too vague to notice it while I'm racing. I do prefer a heavy throttle spring, and this one has plenty of tension. I find this helps me modulate my inputs with more control, and prevents my tendency to stamp on the gas pedal early, exiting corners. It's a good feeling pedal that suits my driving style well. As for the clutch, well for sure it lacks that distinctive clutch sensation. That's a shame as it does look like the pedal design was going for that, but they didn't manage to work it out. Otherwise a perfectly functional pedal, supported by a decently strong spring. Moving on to the brake, firstly the load cell sensor is rated at 70 kilograms. That should be enough to cater for just about anyone. A load cell brake on any pedal set effectively is doing the same thing. It converts the weight force from your leg into braking force in the game. Sitting between the pedal and the load cell will be a spring or springs. It could be metal, rubber, foam or elastomers. Or possibly a hybrid combination of different materials. In the case of the Simjack mini pedals, it's a metal spring and a firm rubber cylinder. As you apply pressure into the pedal, you feel the resistance and movement of the pedal. The metal spring has decent resistance, but largely feels linear during the pedal travel. When the spring fully compresses, you hit that firm rubber piece. The rubber has very little compression and feels like a hard stop. In DI view, when setting the max braking threshold, you could set it so when the spring is fully compressed, that's the maximum braking force, in other words 100% braking, though I didn't set it like that. For me, the fully compressed spring is about 50% braking force in the game, and then I need to push more weight into the hard rubber section for additional braking force. It's an abrupt transition that doesn't feel quite natural, but it does offer an obvious and repeatable braking reference point I was able to use. Generally, I was slowing the car down with fair control, though I wasn't always confident on the brake. The metal spring lacks a clear progressive sensation, so my braking consistency within that portion of the pedal motion wasn't perfect but I managed to get by. I ran the pedals across vintage, modern GT and formula cars, and it was drivable across the board, but I'm definitely not satisfied with the feel of the brake. The load cell sensor is doing its part, it's the spring and rubber that are not optimal here. I'm not getting a proper progressive brake sensation, so it's not ideal. There should be a simple solution to fix this by replacing the spring and rubber piece with something better. The rod is easily accessible so modding the brake will be easy and I do plan to do that but not today. I'll break that out in a separate video. Check the video description as I will drop a link to that video when it's available. 
At the top of the video, I mentioned the SimJack Minis being an alternative to the likes of the similarly priced Thrustmaster TLCM or Fanatec CSL pedals. The SimJack Minis are more of an effort to set up than those other pedal sets as we have to use third party software, but the Minis have a denser and more premium feel under my feet than those other pedal sets. And I know this for a fact as I have reviewed both those other pedal sets and I will drop links in the description to those reviews as well. Normally when you buy expensive pedals, it's diminishing returns on lap time performance. It's about having a more substantial feeling pedal set for realism. And the Simjack Minis have this characteristic. When you're pounding on these pedals, they feel sturdy and have a texture and depth that cheaper pedals simply don't have. The TLCM and CSL pedals don't have this. They are very functional but feel quite bland in comparison. I should also say the Simjack Minis aren't quite as refined or smooth as more expensive pedal sets, but they do close the gap in some areas. So they are not equal to my Husenfeld Pro pedals, for example, and that's fine, you're not paying a ton of money here, but they do feel just as robust as my Husenfeld Pro pedals and also have some useful adjustment features like my Husenfeld Pro pedals too. So we get some decent features shared by more expensive pedal sets and the price here is way more attractive. The minis come with a few negative points that I have already covered, so not perfect, but nothing that prevents them doing their job. I like the throttle, the clutch is okay, and I've already described the brake in detail, so I don't need to add anything else there. Throughout my testing, they ran reliably as long as I didn't run them off a USB hub. You may not experience any problems using a USB hub, but it's worth remembering in case you do. I'm not going to recommend the Simjack Minis or tell you to avoid them. The takeaway is a mix of positives and minor negatives. The positives outweigh the negatives, that's for sure. And for my coverage here, now you know too what you can expect from these pedals. Nothing technically held me back, but improvements could be made, one of which is modding the brake spring. And once I've performed that job, I'm sure I will enjoy these pedals a lot more. And that takes us to the end of this review. If you own these pedals, please share your experience in the comments. I hope you found this review useful, and if you do like my content, you can support me by becoming a channel member. Click the join button for details. Thanks for watching, and until next time, happy simming, and bye bye.